Welcome to the Hanu Health Podcast, where our mission is to help you to breathe better and stress less. On this show, we discuss a variety of topics and provide practical suggestions for improving health and well-being. However, none of the education, tips, and tricks provided should be taken as medical advice. Your medical doctor is your best bet if you have medical questions. Also, on this podcast, we interview numerous guests from diverse backgrounds, interests, and may carry some unique ideas. Hanu Health as a company does not endorse all all statements provided by guests or condone all suggestions or protocols discussed. We just like hearing about cool people doing rad and new things. So sit back, relax, breathe, and enjoy the show. So Dr. Leo Lagos, I was uh, prepping for today thinking this is going to be either an amazing epic podcast or a dangerous podcast because you've got two clinical health psychologists and performance psychologists who specialize in HRV and psychophysiology in one room. And so, man, we don't know what is going to happen today. So I'm excited to have you on. Thanks for coming on the Hanu Health Podcast. My pleasure, Jay. Yes, indeed. So, Leah, I think it might be best if we just open up with a little bit of an introduction so that people kind of know who you are, which, you know, a lot of people that follow the work of heart rate variability, of kind of psychophysiology, stress resiliency, and a lot of people who listen and tune into this podcast may already know who you are. But why don't you just kind of take it from the top and, and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do and why you do it. So, Jay, for the last 15 plus years, I have specialized in health and performance psychology with a focus on heart rate variability biofeedback. I believe strongly that we are addressing health and performance largely from the wrong paradigm that we have to treat the body first and the mind second. That if we mm-hmm. train the body to precisely self-regulate, uh, recover from stress faster, we can expedite any cognitive technique exponentially, whether it's a child or someone working for a Fortune 500 company. Mm-hmm. So for the last decade and a half, I've worked with peak performers throughout the world, from competitive athletes at the collegiate level to NBA players to P- uh, PGA Tour players to people in the financial world uh, making important decisions during moments of critical crisis and challenge to help them perform at their optimal level of ability. And mm. from my perspective, it all begins with the heart. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because like people may not realize it. Obviously, you and I realize this, but, you know, the major kind of paradigm in, in modern psychology is not necessarily body first, mind second. Um, it's very cognitive focused. I mean, a lot of people have probably heard cognitive behavioral therapy. Like if you turn on the TV and watch like Noom commercials, like Noom talks all about CBT for weight loss. And so people are becoming more f- familiar with this whole idea of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive therapy, but may not realize too that they could be missing a huge or valuable component that is kind of the manifestation that stress plays in the body. So I'd love to open that up with you. But how did did you find yourself into this field? Because I mean, you know, obviously, I come in a certain direction of kind of how I found my way into HRV. But where was your exposure there? Like, how did you even learn about this? Sure, sure. So in grad school, Jay, I'm focusing on sports psychology and performance psychology, working with Rutgers teams, athletic teams, during my graduate school days, I would say 90% of the athletes that I was seeing were struggling with anxiety Hmm. of different forms, whether it was anxiety on the court, on the field, in relationships, at school. It was a common theme. And these people had time kinds of limits on they needed a certain outcome and a certain amount of time and the scientific process to get there. And so I sat in on a talk given by Dr. Paul Lear, who's a Harvard-trained clinician and really one of the founding fathers of heart rate variability biofeedback, espousing the benefits of HRV biofeedback to treat clinical levels of anxiety and depression. So after his talk, Jay, I walked up and I said, Dr. Lear, do you think this could be helpful for performers? Little did I know that would lead to my next 15 years of research and practice. (laughs) So for my dissertation, I worked with the Rutgers golf team. Using HRV biofeedback, I built a lab 
at the Center of Alcohol Studies. It was where one of the sports psychologists at the time, Dr. Robert Pandina, uh, was the director of. And, and so we worked together with the Rutgers golf team, specifically implementing heart rate variability biofeedback and evaluating the impact on health and performance. And here's the thing that was amazing. It was supposed to be 10 weeks. We worked together a little uh, over a year and a half. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and they, Short and term started, to longitudinal is just like that, right? Right. <laughs> and they said, why do you want to keep doing this? And they said, look, Doc, this has improved our, our golf performance, but our grades have never been higher. Our team feels more cohesive. Our eating is better. And lo and behold, that launched my interest in HRV biofeedback and understanding the benefits for athletes that even extended beyond just performance, well, performance in relationships, performance on the field. So uh, performance in relationships, performance mm. in health. And it was mesmerizing right. to see how powerful these impacts in how many different ways, learning to control how your body responds to stress and how quickly it recovers wow. um, could impact so many dimensions of functioning at once. Yeah, I I love that story because I have found it to parallel with my experience as well, which is like I will see many of these, you know, elite performing athletes who they come to me with this kind of idea of like help me out with sports performance. And that's kind of where their mindset is. I mean, it only makes sense, right? As an athlete, they want to do well at what their job is and their passion is. However, they start to see it translate into other areas of life. They're like, well, yes, I improved my sports performance, but also too, I'm feeling less anxious. Anxious. I'm feeling less stress. I'm more. Um, I'm less isolative. You know, with with kind of my social groups. I'm engaging more with others. And I think that's the incredible effect that you can kind of package it in this idea of like we can utilize HRV biofeedback as a means to help with sports performance. But it has all of these translative effects into other areas of life, which is, is it's so a, fascinating. It's so fascinating, and it also is an incredible way to quickly establish trust with someone you've just mm -hmm. started working. Indeed. Because you can read their physiology and understand, uh, you know, their biorhythms, how their body's responding and when they're locking and how hard it is for them to let go. Mm. And and it's it's even without words. So right. people people feel really understood and it allows then for even a deeper exploration of other kind of areas for health and performance obstruction. Indeed. Well, if you just start to try to jump in purely cognitively or try to go too deep too fast, like people resist that. That's why we have such a high attrition rate within the field of psychotherapy, right? It's because a lot of times the in individuals, uh, they come in kind of with the with these problems, with this baggage, just like every one of us have. And then when we try to take it too deep too fast, don't develop rapport or kind of use other strategies like objective data at times, like people don't have a lot of that trust, a lot of that buy-in. And so they tend to be a little bit more closed off, which is a lot harder nut to crack, if you will. So I love that approach. And I feel very similarly in the way that I approach things. Because uh, for me too, and, and I don't know if your mind works this way, Leah, but for me, like, I, I'm just I've always been a scientist, even since I was a small child. And so for me, like objective data was always the thing that I looked to first, like I wasn't very good at like kind of subjectively checking in, I'm a lot better now. Um, and, and I have to thank, you know, a lot of psychophysiology and biofeedback for that. But for me, it was like I could be sold on this idea of something working and changing if I could kind of see it play out objectively. And so for me, it was kind of more of the buy-in when I saw that data. Does your mind work like that or am I one of the only ones who like goes uh, I that I love route? the data. And frankly, I think it is one of the most powerful mediums for behavioral change mm -hmm. to, to see that kind of data. So it, I think it is such a powerful medium. And, and there are so many ages beyond – you know, athletes in college or athletes at the Olympics that can use this. And, yeah. and that is one of my missions in life to help people understand right. that a heart rate variability biofeedback can be transformative for kids. It can be transformative for, for people that are retired. Yes, <laughs> um, indeed. Because so many 
different extensions and utilities. Indeed. Well, for the listeners who don't know, we'll take a step back because we've been, you know, throwing around some terminology. We've been talking about this thing called HRV biofeedback. You know, again, a lot of the people listening to this podcast and follow Hanu Health likely know what HRV is. However, I think it would, uh, you know, do a, a huge service to those who may not know if we could just kind of unpack some of this terminology. So uh, even taking a step back further, even before we talk about HRV, like one of the concepts that you mentioned, which I think could segue nicely into talking about HRV, is you talk about this concept, again, about how we can look to the body to kind of assess the level of stress, uh, and then also use it as a therapeutic, as opposed to just going, you know, straight cognitive. So what do you mean by that? Uh, Maybe even two, what evidence do you have for that? I want people to understand we've been addressing the mind from the mind. (laughs) And actually, it's, it's like taking the local route in the subway instead of a, a, you know, the, the expedited track and you can shift the body to shift the mind and it's effective. It's scientific. It's faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would encourage people to start there, <laughs> even mm-hmm. as a clinical psychologist by trade um, and specifically learning to control your heart rhythms and optimize your heart rhythms. People talk about clinical measures of HRV, SDNN and such. There's a very easy way for people at home to look at HRV without some of the metrics, which Mm -hmm. is peak to trough ratio, meaning your heart rate goes up when you inhale and it goes down when you exhale. Mm -hmm. You want these oscillations to be like big ocean waves as opposed to small (laughs) little hits. And, And so that can be such a powerful medium too for people to see because they're able to actually see the changes they're making in their heart rhythms. Mm. As we increase the peak amplitude of those oscillations, we actually gain greater control of our prefrontal lobe. Our prefrontal lobe is the executive functioning center of our body. I call it the screen door. It allows us to inhibit, to organize, to emotionally regulate. And there is a correlation between those peak uh, heart rhythms and and how much control you have over the prefrontal lobe. Mm-hmm. We also know, and this is from Evgeny Vashilu's work at Rutgers, blood vessel diameter of someone who is breathing at their resonant frequency is slightly larger mm-hmm. than someone who is just breathing normally. And and so these oscillations, the the kind of beautiful ocean like waves are mirrored in our brain. And so Mm -hmm. that's one thing I really want people to understand and learn to do, which is you can train your heart to train your mind. Yeah. I love, I love that you speak to this idea that, you know, health tech is cool. I mean, obviously Hanu Health is a health technology company. So obviously (laughs) we're going to speak to how much we love objective data. But the thing is, is that we can also operate as our own biofeedback machines and utilize our physiology and our level of interoception, our ability to kind of connect with what's going on in our body as a biofeedback mechanism. I find myself sometimes too, if I'm a little bit stressed and I don't want to utilize hardware or technology, I mean, I'll just place two fingers on the carotid artery, you know, on the neck and I'll just inhale and exhale and I'll just feel it. I will feel the changes of my pulse rate going through my fingers as I'm checking my pulse. And that to me in and of itself just heightens my level again of interoception and helps me to connect to my body. And it goes back to this idea that if I utilize my body as the signaling mechanism to my frontal lobe and to cognition, like, it just tends to be much more effective than trying to fight cognition with cognition. Because I, I get I get in a battle. I get, in, I get in such a battle when I try to just be purely cognitive, which I think is one of my more natural inclinations. I just tend to be a very cognitive person. And so for me, like it just, my mind goes off. And then I find that nasty little spiral effect of just like cognition fighting cognition. And it's this never ending battle. Whereas what you're saying is that we we take the time to tune into the body and affect change both through our respiration or our breathing and then through our heart, then, then we can actually see a calming effect of the cognition by that being our first strategy or tactic. Is that, is that what you're saying, Leah? Yes. Correct. Yeah, Correct. In, indeed. No, it's it's such a it's such a beautiful thing, and I think that's a part of who we are evolutionarily, right? I mean, this is a built-in mechanism that we have accessibility to at at all times. Um, and you know, I don't think that you and I would say that 
that, you know, the cognition, especially the mindfulness aspects are something we throw out the window, but I don't necessarily, you and I think that it's the thing that we turn to first and solely. It's not the starting point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed. The starting point is your body and you can expedite how quickly you can absorb, embrace, uh, implement mindfulness techniques. If first you've trained precision in the body, uh, for how you want to respond at specific moments. And, um, I, I, I really believe Jay, that the more people that understand that, that we can shift the mind by shifting the body first, and we can do it faster, we, we begin to create a different world. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you as well. Uh, what say you uh, when someone, um, uh, l- let's say someone is kind of having significant difficulty with, the, you know, their experience of stress, or their experience ang- of anxiety, uh, we're going to move into again, kind of to more of the, the techie side of HRV biofeedback and training here in just a second. But what what's the lowest hanging fruit for you? So if somebody's experiencing stress, anxiety in the moment, for you, what do you tell them? Sure. So we look at different pillars uh, that of health and performance. I'll ask about sleep. I'll ask about mm-hmm. exercise. I'll ask about their close relationships. I do believe, and I've seen it with HRV, interpersonal connection, deep, meaningful interpersonal connection absolutely will impact autonomic flexibility. Mm-hmm. It's how we're wired, I believe, <laughs> to right. survive and thrive. Right. So we begin to look at these different pillars um, and, and also incorporating techniques to help manage the stress response. HRV biofeedback being one that that we know is scientific and effective, also the exercise piece. Um, But essentially, I'm asking kind of it's a needs assessment. Where are you at in terms of having pillars to manage your stress response? The one thing we know in life is (laughs) we will have stress. There is there is no avoiding it. Yes. So now we have to train for it. And it's so funny, you know, you take a tennis player preparing for the U.S. Open and they do a thousand serves before they go to the Open. Why? So they don't have to think about it. The muscle is trained. It has the memory. We can train the heart mm-hmm. in the very same way we would we would train our muscles for a tennis serve to operate optimally uh, during performance moments and to have those big, beautiful oscillations, being able to recover faster even when stress happens. Those are some of the areas that that I start with. Right. So you train it as a reflex. So when the moment comes, you don't even have to think about it. You just engage and it just happens. And I think that, you know, that goes back to kind of these basic foundations of of physiological conditioning and how the more and more we do something for better or for worse, uh, that we condition these responses, um, which is, which again, great and beautiful thing. You know, it's a part of our human evolution. And then there's the piece that we're moving towards, which is not just using the HRV biofeedback as two bookends at the start and the end of the day to Mm -hmm. create that automated response or to sleep better, but actually using the resonance breathing during moments in the day where HRV drops. Yes. And, And then being able to recover faster. And we need more research, but I've already heard it from, uh, you know, leaders, cognitive leaders, Mm -hmm. um, that it optimizes cognitive flexibility. Right. So, so that's the next piece is using the HRV actually during the day, during mm-hmm. stress moments, or even knowing in advance this is going to be stressful for me and mapping yeah. out times to breathe during the day so it's a, a form of prevention as, a, as opposed to intervention. Indeed, you know, that's that's the next wave for sure. Uh, the next wave is really collecting the uh, needed research for looking at continuous HRV, both monitoring and then also to training, uh, which again, obviously, will, will be a little bit more cryptic, um, but I'll also, you know, show my cards because we've already shown our cards a little bit is, is, you know, that's what we're looking at at Hanu Health. I mean, that's our hope and our goal is to see whether or not this is a viable option for helping people to condition a better reflex for when they're experiencing stress, when they're experiencing anxiety throughout the day because a lot of times you're right we tend to bookend it we'll measure and train hrv you know first thing in the morning and then we'll measure and train it at the end of the day and that can be great I mean, it can be a great primer for the rest of the day it can also be a great primer for sleep and it's an excellent way to condition the nervous system but would we benefit it from it even more so throughout the day you now as a kind of continuous level of monitor and training yeah yeah and i and i think it's such a needed 
piece. Mm -hmm. And then the next iteration beyond that is using this to optimize performance. We know it in, it impacts being able to be vulnerable with people. So connecting right. deeply or speaking in front of a large audience and, and using this kind of data to optimize your inner self yes. <laughs> for, for performance moments. So not just as an intervention for stress, but a way to optimize performance across specific domains. Indeed. Leah, there's so many myths and misunderstandings as to what HRV is. I mean, this is something that is, you know, all over the news. It's in built into every single wearable. Like uh, most people that are in the health and wellness space probably have heard or have somewhat of an understanding of what HRV. I would say as it continues to be the bulk majority of people still don't know what HRV is. But I think, again, a lot of it comes down to there being so many myths and misunderstandings. How do you simplify and share with your clientele? what heart rate variability is and what its usefulness is. So I say there's two definitions. There's the scientific definition, which looks at uh, peak beats of the heartbeat and the time in between. Mm -hmm. and, and we want there to be great variability in between those beats. Um, the second one is the clinical that I mentioned earlier, which is just easier for people to grasp, to see the peak to trough. When you inhale, your baseline heart rate is 50. You inhale to 70, it goes mm -hmm. back to 50. Mm -hmm. And being able to see that. Um, from, a, from an index measure, I say to people that this is a measure of your body's flexibility to manage stress. The stronger it is, the more you can precisely navigate under pressure. So you can be a Ferrari instead of, you know, in, instead of a, a Volvo station wagon, which is dependable mm -hmm. and reliable and there's nothing wrong with it. But we want precision in right. this stress moment. So the reaction is a little tighter or meaning less, less reactive unless you need to be and that you can recover faster. There is oftentimes a fear that they won't be able to amp up. This is not this is not necessarily a calming mechanism, and I'm very clear about this. Mm -hmm. This holds the reflexes, so they're more efficient. If they need to amp up, they can amp up, but they can let go and reset faster and mm -hmm. more efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, the other piece that I've been talking with clients about is is the cognitive piece. That now we're also looking at HRV as an index of blood flow to the brain. Mm -hmm. So higher HRV, more blood flow to the brain, fuel for cognitive dexterity, for processing, for emotional regulation, for inhibition. And the inhibitory responses are so pivotal to being able to be objective decision makers under pressure. So, you know, basically what we're talking about is, is HRV being the best non-invasive proxy that we have for nervous system functioning and our ability to uh, modulate uh, HRV is also indicative of our ability uh, to adapt to stress. And so one of the things that I clarify a lot to my clientele is that, uh, you know, so many people get really concerned, and this is a huge myth in the HRV area, they get concerned of where their HRV is to start as a baseline and be, they're comparing it to everybody. So they're like, oh, it looks like, you know, so-and-so. So in the health and wellness field posted their aura ring score and their HRV, their RMSSD is like a 120 and mine is a 40 and they get really nervous. They say, well, that 120 means that individual must be super resilient to stress. They must have kind of this really great flexibility. And me at 40, like they're like, I don't feel particularly subjectively stressed, uh, but my numbers are super low. Like, should I be concerned? Do you get that question a lot, Leah? Like, do people ask you about that? And then what's your response to them? Yeah, I say this is not about comparing yourself to others. This is about optimizing your range. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at what your range is. And for two weeks, we track and we oftentimes use Aura Ring to track mm -hmm. nocturnal HRV, which mm -hmm. is a good role measure. The Aura Ring is a respectable device to do that. Um, and we get a range. So let's say this person is in the 70s certain evenings and, uh, you know, has a disparity of high 30s on other evenings. And then we'll look at the variables that intersect or or impact their HRV, both the ones that amplify. And I've, I've seen, it's so interesting, Jay, people being around their family or their close friends or people they love and their HRV is more robust on that mm -hmm. day. I've seen 
alcohol for some people are, are more sensitive to alcohol and you look at what happens with their HRV after only two glasses of wine and you say you may really want to think about not drinking at least yes. during the week when when you need to perform at your best let's be look at what this does for other people they don't necessarily have that sensitivity so it becomes and I really try and get people and it's such an important question Jay because it can create anxiety when they compare themselves to others to right. stop the comparison we're optimizing them and trying to understand the individual individual kind of inputs that amplify or detract from their HRV yeah, I love it. You know, there's there's not a lot of great research looking at um, kind of normative comparison of HRV. Like we look at it from a cardiorespiratory perspective, especially cardiovascular perspective, and this is you know normally based on 24 hour readings uh, and based on after a myocardial infarction, after heart attacks, then we can utilize some of that information um, to deduce um, kind of different categories of health from a cardiovascular standpoint. But from a nervous system functioning standpoint, stress resiliency standpoint. There's not a lot of great research to say, hey, here are the numbers that you should be comparing normatively. That's just not there. We're comparing our own self. Uh, we're comparing our own baselines. Yeah, and it's so important because I, I, don't, I get emails every single week from individuals who are like, can you help me with my low HRV? Like, I've been looking at what other people are. Should I be higher? And I'm like, no, no, no. It's, that's not the way this works. <laughs> this doesn't just work as us kind of being able to compare to everybody else. It's just it's, it's apples and oranges sometimes. There's a lot of different variables variables and components that go in to what make up that score of, of HRV. So I like what you mentioned there. Now, Leah, you mentioned something that a lot of people ask me about when it comes to HRV biofeedback. And this term is thrown out there. And I've heard it used, you know, correctly and incorrectly. And I know that you know, obviously what this is, and you know, the correct definition, and you've studied it. What is this term of resonance frequency? What does that mean? How do we determine that number? And why is that even important for us? Ah, it is so important. And in so many ways, I think we're all trying to determine our, what creates resonance beyond just breathing, which mm. you and I can talk about. Yeah. But when we breathe at a specific rate that our heart rate and our breathing rate, our respiration rate coincide, it amplifies our heart rhythms and it creates what's called 0.1 hertz uh, in the heart. And what's really interesting is via the vagus nerve, which starts in the midbrain, innervated through the heart and goes to the gut, is that 0.1 hertz troubles. It will, it will impact the gut. It will also impact the brain. And so mm -hmm. Evgeny Vashilo, uh, who was my mentor at Rutgers, um, and uh, his wife actually looked at what happens when people breathe at their resonant frequency, looking at MRIs of brains, and they see 0.1 hertz pop up. Mm. throughout different areas of the brain. It almost gives me goosebumps to think about. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so the point one hertz is uh, some people will even consider it a frequency associated with flow. It's a parasympathetic mm -hmm. dominant state, open receptiveness, not necessarily just calm, but it puts you at your baseline self for full aptitude. And so many people, Jay, have this idea that performance enhancement means pushing themselves Mm -hmm. And so much about resonant frequency is about authenticity, mm -hmm. about finding that rate of breathing that's authentic to you and allows you to be at your full range of self. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're really striving to do. There are different rates for different people, oftentimes based on height and weight. Um, you know, yours may be 6.0, mine may be 5.7. It doesn't matter. There is no better, free, there's no better rate for one person. It's just creating that 0.1 hertz throughout the system. Mm -hmm. Now, what else is interesting is we can breathe at resonant frequency and essentially put our system into a parasympathetic state. And that's what you're honing by practicing 20 minutes twice a day, the ability to activate that parasympathetic state on demand, as well as be in parasympathetic dominance much more than sympathetic dominance. But you can also look at building an ecosystem outside of you that creates resonance. If I showed you the colors in my office, it's no chance that, that those are calming colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, people will choose to live in demographic places, moving from Greenwich to California, New York to Costa Rica, uh, you know, New Jersey to Florida, being by the water, they can feel is puts them in a state of resonance. So it's really interesting to start to change how you live your life a little bit according to what puts you into resonance, which leads me to a little story. Yes, <laughs> please know, do tell. 
you know I love to track HRV, mm-hmm. and and uh, um, I monitored my HRV for a two week period and I looked at the peaks and troughs trying to design an ecosystem Mm -hmm. that started my day with the most robust HRV, not just upon wake up, but that I could amplify it even beyond and then keep it as, you know, at a particular level, uh, for the longest period of time and Mm -hmm. what factors would feed into it. And, and, it was really interesting because we think about exercising in the morning is a great thing for everybody. It's not for some people it is. And some mm-hmm. people it drops their HRV. And I found that it exercising in the eve, not evening, but late afternoon mm-hmm. was better for my HRV kind of peaks. But the other was looking at when I took my daughters to school, when I made time to be the parent that took them to school in the morning, my HRV out of all the variables I was looking at would, would predict the highest HRV for the longest amount of wow. time. So I changed wow. my schedule. Isn't that fascinating? So you it's start, fascinating. You start to learn resonance is, uh, you know, just the breathing frequency is one, but, but it, it's about understanding your system, your authentic system to put mm-hmm. you in a state of resonance, both internally and from the external inputs. Yeah, you know, the relationship piece is really interesting, especially I, I see it with my kids as well. But sometimes, especially I've got two young kids, I've got a four year old and then a two year old. And so uh, if anybody who has a four year old and two year old or whoever has knows that uh, that can be difficult ages at times. And so sometimes they drop my HRV <laughs> reasonably so, but then other times too. And again, and this is aside from me modulating my respiratory rate, kind of even focusing on that. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll share a little bit of that here in this in, in just a second. But one of the things I've known is very similar to you. It's just like those close relationships. If I'm snuggling with my, my two little boys, or if I'm snuggling with my wife, if we're close, my HRV amplitude just like heightens so incredibly much. And what I've noticed too, and this is kind of going to the point that I was mentioning just a second ago, is that I've actually noticed, I don't know if I've conditioned this response. You tell me, this would be a great question for you, Lee, if you know. I've actually noticed that when I'm with them, and this probably is because I'm in such a a, a parasympathetic flow at that time, that I naturally will start breathing slower. Um, And so it's like this combination of like love and affection and closeness and oxytocin, like yes. combined with like these changes in the cardiorespiratory cycle. Like, do you slow your breathing down, or like even if it's subconsciously, like when you're in those situations? A hundred percent. But here's the thing, and and that is so fascinating is that we can draw upon these experiences, Jay, and we can use them during our breathing moments to mm-hmm. essentially shift our body faster. So. Yeah. What I've found with my clients is, so uh, memories, um, snuggling with with your kids, and maybe there was a particular memory over this weekend, Mm -hmm. you were all snuggled and and under the covers, and it was very sweet, and your heart just just felt so in flow, but your heart remembers that. And then for you, even in moments when you're not snuggled with them under the covers, even stressful moments or moments of doubt or or just moments where you want to amplify your your physiology for a specific reason, you can bring up that memory from the heart. And it's not cognitive. It's it's focusing on how your heart felt, that incredible love, and then using your resonant breathing and and being able to activate that resonance state even faster when you pair that specific physiological memory. It's not just cognitive right. with the inhale and let go of the rest of the world. Hey, Jay here. Hate to interrupt this show, but I have to tell you about our amazing sponsor for today's episode. Yeah, it's Hanu Health. That's H-A-N-U Health, my company. And I've got good news and I've got bad news. So the bad news is is that I'm going to have to be quite cryptic for a while as to what we're building, but what I can say is that it is in the space of health technology, and it's going to be revolutionary. Just think about this show. You have myself, who is an expert in heart rate variability, and Patrick, who is an expert in breath work, and he is one of our primary advisors. Hmm... 
And what's the good news? Well, even though you have no idea about what the company is offering as a product, we are offering an exclusive VIP waiting list so that you can be the first to know about it. Not only will you reserve your spot in line, you will also gain access to our informative newsletter. We will update you on where we are as a company and provide special incentives and promotions. All you need to do is go to hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. That is hanuhealth.com slash waitlist. I promise you will not want to miss out on what is to come. We are building the biohacker's dream, but it will be useful for every human being on this planet. I'm, I'm not even speaking in hyperbole. I'm serious. Every human could benefit from what we are making. So again, head on over to hanuhealth.com slash waitlist to get your spot now. And I will just, you know, leave you with bated breath. Yeah, it is so incredible, kind of the relationship there. And, and it's not something that I really noticed until I had kids, like prior to kids. Like, I just didn't make as much of that connection. It's not to say that you can't make that connection if you don't have kids. Um, but for me, that's where it kind of really started to started to kind of sink in. And, and I've had this happen on multiple occasions where I'll be practicing, um, you know, just intentional breathing, HRV biofeedback, like in the morning. Um, and I'm not kind of cognitively like thinking about like my kids or like my wife or relationships relationships. Um, but then all of a sudden, like in just me, like engaging that part of my system, I'll just have like these flashes of like my kid's face or them smiling, or I'll hear them laughing. And I know that might sound a little esoteric to people who are like listening to this, but it's so interesting because like when that starts to kind of like come into the brain, when I'm engaging in these practices, then I'll see my amplitude of heart rate variability go up even higher than just respiration alone. So it's that kind of demonstrates that there's not just kind of this one-way street here. It's bi-directional in nature um, that you can kind of like utilize those memories like you mentioned to help uh, when you're engaging in biofeedback training. But also too, there's the inverse of kind of like you'll engage in it and it will help to kind of bring these things up, uh, which is just such an, a, a, a powerful tool and, and, and technique. And so, yeah, it's one of those things that like if people have not started engaging in resonant breathing, if they've not started engaging in biofeedback, like it's hopefully we've sold it at least just initially kind of on, on, on that end. Have you heard of any stories like that before? Like people, people just saying like they'll be breathing and then all of a sudden like these, almost like these really great memories will start to flood. And I'm sure maybe the opposite can happen sometimes too. Like, especially if people have experienced trauma, um, you know, things creep into the mind um, at all times, but I didn't know if you've experienced that before. Yeah, uh, just the opening, uh, you know, the opening of the heart, and mm -hmm. and that that can open all sorts of different emotions. Um, I, I do feel this opens the heart, strengthens strengthens the mind too, but having a heart that's flexible that can feel deeply and let go has such a host of benefits mm -hmm. for any type of performer or being, the ability to connect deeply. Um, the, the ability to be creative. Uh, the connection piece, I think, is so important right now in this world mm -hmm. that's becoming increasingly fragmented. And I've worked with sports teams where where we've used the HRV, I've trained them as a team together as opposed to individual sessions. It's really phenomenal, Jay. Their hearts start to sink. So, mm -hmm. so you see the heart rhythms of, you know, a pod of, of six women basketball players all in the same unison and the wow. coach comes to me after about seven weeks of the training and says it's very bizarre I think it has to do with this training because we're not doing anything else but the girls that train in pods with you we were training in pods of four to six um, they now hang out together they're like insulated groups of friends and wow. and as their physiology started to shift and match and mirror each other those connections seem to strengthen and that also happens, you know, if you, in marriages, um, mm -hmm. we see there is literature that in the middle of the night, uh, uh, couples' heart rhythms synchronize. Um, and I have not seen that. That's incredible. Yeah. I did yeah. not realize. Is that regardless of practice, or is that is that with practice they can get their hearts to well, sync? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, yeah. I think it can be expedited with practice. Right. Right. But sure. Yeah, um, but um, there is some, I think, evolutionary benefit to physiology matching. 
um, and and people feeling really connected. And I think it is such an important thing for this world to experiment physiological connection. It's deep. It's relevant. Yeah. It matters. Um, I've worked with couples in you know um, performance situations where they needed to feel really connected and so we match their physiology for performance reasons let's say you know ice skaters but Mm -hmm. but you know they come back and they report our relationship has never felt more intertwined and trustworthy so there is something to this idea of training our physiology to connect more deeply whether it's with teams or partners um, or even strangers, isn't it? Wouldn't that be an interesting experiment yeah. <laughs> to keep strangers together and then synchronize yeah. their physiology and rate their feelings of closeness? Yeah. You know, I, I just come to, you know, the first thing that pops in my head is that, you know, uh, I conceptualize what we're going through right now um, with with the COVID-19 pandemic. Hopefully, my goodness, hopefully we're on the, the back end of that. But I conceptualize kind of us having been in for the last two years, you know, a double pandemic. I mean, it's been COVID-19, but it's also been the stress, anxiety and isolation pandemic. Um, and, 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 you know, they're both obviously very much interconnected with each other. And I think about kind of like how my experience is especially not being able to have been with, you know, family and friends nearly as often as what I was used to about how that disconnection um, I, I, uh, has been probably one of the most detrimental things to my overall sense of, of mental well-being. I'm um, just not being able to be physically connected. You know, we can do the Zoom thing. Like, it's great. I love technology. But there's just something about being in the presence of other people. Um, and, and I think a lot of it has to is like our, our for, due to some physiological mechanism like our body senses, we pick up on everybody who's around us. It's kind of like that just uh, emotional and kind of energetic pull that we feel. And again, I realize from a lot of people, this might sound a little bit kind of like woo woo and esoteric. But what's so interesting, and the reason I bring this up is because you're saying that like, while we may not fully understand all of the physiological mechanisms of action here, we do know from research uh, that again, the more time that we're spending with people, and the more time that we're engaging in these practices that you're mentioning, like, we're synchronizing ourselves (laughs) with one another. And this is just an absolutely beautiful part of humanity. And so I just wonder too, kind of as we come out of the the backside of this pandemic, um, like what are the things that we should be doing on this end to make sure that if we were synchronous with somebody and now we're maybe a little bit asynchronous, like what do we do to get back to that? Like, do you have any suggestions there? I love that question. And I think it is such just a critical question to think about at this time. Mm -hmm. Everyone's excited for everything to just pop back to normal. Um, but what do we need to do to, to get there? Um, you know, I just, I think there is, there's never been a better time to, to be doing this as families with kids. Do you know my kids? Well, uh, my little, my little Maddie is six and my Felicity is three. Mm -hmm. And, and if one gets upset, uh, you know, over a toy or I've heard them say, just take a breath. They understand. And, Mm -hmm. and, and even even though they're young, we've experimented with breathing just to show them they do have control over their body. So what, getting back to your question, I, you know, I see this starting at a family place mm-hmm. Where, mm-hmm. where families, and it doesn't have to be 20 minutes twice a day, right. but, but maybe it becomes a family routine for some time, just mm-hmm. syncing the family together. And what's interesting, Jay, is you can do that with breathing. You can also do that with music. Mm-hmm. Music will oftentimes elicit similar physiological responses. Right. But, uh, you know, they can also vary too. People can yeah. have different. But, um, but it's, it's another way to try and elicit a similar uh, physiological state quickly within a family unit. Um, yeah. I, I love that. I love, you know, the, the family unit, um, those who we're close with, um, you know, that, that, that should be kind of the go-to. And I, and I, and I really love that. I've noticed the same thing that you just mentioned. Um, and again, it's probably cause, you know, we're both, you know, performance psychologists and health psychologists who I uh, talk about this a lot with family. Uh, but with my oldest, especially my two year old, I, I don't think he understands, you know, breathing just yet. Um, uh, uh, he does it and he does breathe, uh, but I understand it conceptually, not so much, but it's funny because, um, you know, my, with my four year old, 
it'll be, you know, he'll get kind of emotionally, you know, ramped up with something, you know, just, you know, four year olds, it could be anything. And for him, it's like, you know, all I have to do is sit next to him and I say, all right, buddy, like, let's just take a deep breath. Like, let's just really engage that. And then I'll just, I'll just, he'll just model me because I'll, I'll breathe in slowly and out slowly. And, uh, it's just so interesting the amount of calming effect that he'll have. And almost every single time he does this, and this might just be my own, my own kids. I'll brag on a little bit, like almost every single time after if just a few breaths like it doesn't take much maybe four or five breaths he'll just lean over to me and snuggle into me and he'll just hug me and i'm like oh beautiful and And it's it's not just your kids and that's Mm, such i I love that story and it's so beautiful jay and and i want i hope every parent can harness the power of the breath within their own children um but there's something really accelerated in terms of children's hearts and Mm. how quickly when they engage these kinds of trainings, they can shift their heart much faster than we yeah. can. Oh, it's uh, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. It, it's, it's one of those things too. I think what a lot of times we overlook kind of the effect of, uh, you know, being within kind of the family context within the relationship context. And then also too, with children, um, that they're battling with a lot of stress and anxiety and a lot of, uh, uh things that we as adults are battling with because the, especially with a pandemic, like they've been pulled away, you know, from being socially isolative, just like we have, and we can understand it, right? Like we can put it in into a framework of like, oh, we have to do X, Y, and Z in order to protect us from, you know, from, you know, the virus or whatever it may be. And then our, but our kids are like, but I don't understand like why I can't, you know, be at school with my kids or I can't like hug my friends or well, I can't do, you know, whatever it may be. Again, these things are getting better now, but like, I remember in the middle of the pandemic, like it was really getting to my, to my oldest son. And so we tried to use the atmosphere of the family to really just like engage him and give him as much kind of love and affection as we could. So that in turn, like at, while he wasn't kind of within his friend group, like he used to be, um, at least he had um, that kind of within the family context or at least a semblance of that within the family t- context. So that's great. It's really interesting how powerful love is. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I want to just say, I mean, I've, I've worked Shay with, elite performers in uh, from sports to business people making <laughs> important legislative decisions but a uh, hundred million dollar decisions mm. down to, to someone who's making a deci- split second decision on the court and 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 it impacts the entire team's performance and the one universality is love it doesn't matter yeah. it, it, it doesn't matter how tough your position may demand love paired with breathing shifts anyone faster than just breathing alone. Isn't that interesting? It is so interesting. Yeah. For those who tuned into this podcast who were expecting HRV and HRV biofeedback and got love and affection, they're probably like, oh, didn't <laughs> didn't see this coming, which I think is great because I think so many times I'll, I'll go on podcasts and I'm sure you've gone on podcasts. And a lot of times we don't necessarily dive deep into kind of the, the, the field of love and affection. A lot of times it stays, sometimes it's for me, I'll stay a little bit too scientific and I don't yeah. like that. Whereas we have to remember too, that it's not just purely physiological, um, kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, but there's so much from a sociological, from a relationship, um, from a psychological perspective that if we do not make sure that we cover, like we are doing a huge disservice, um, as to uh, kind of how we grow as human beings, um, and how we experience true health and wellness. Um, because, Without those aspects, like I can tell people, you can do everything in the world physiologically. Uh, you can do everything in the world um, from an exercise perspective, nutrition perspective, sleep perspective. But if kind of the the, the love, affection, relationship aspect um, is a part that you're missing, like you're going to feel like that void, like that void is just going to be there. And it's a really difficult place to be. So finding it in whatever way you can, I think is just paramount to our overall health and wellness. And, and it's not this, even just being devoid of it in any way but using it i mean maybe you feel yeah. tons of love and yeah. and and there's no void but using it on demand for performance for right. objective decision making for quick cognitive dexterity it's it's really powerful the only other and I, you know i study these uh, these uh, clinical methods day in day out for years uh, in terms of how to how to get clients to amplify their HRV and to mm-hmm. put themselves in a resident state faster, right? Yeah. yeah. And 
the only other sentiment other than love that is really powerful to pair with resonant frequency breathing. I know this will make you laugh. Magic. Magic. Interesting. Like not like dark demonic black magic, but like, (laughs) (laughs) but no, you're talking about, so like actual, like, like illusion stage type magic. Like, 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 like a, a magical curiosity. And you see these heart rhythms, uh, it's just become more robust. So, so That's anyway, cool. play with that. Play with that. The other piece I wanted to kind of go back to your question because it's, it's such an important one in terms of preparing the world um, to re-engage. And you know, I do think the sense of safety has been threatened. Yeah. And when our sense of safety is threatened, that has a specific impact on our autonomic nervous system, mm-hmm. which is in fact meant to perceive threat and not being safe. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I think it's a really important time um, to think about, and people, when they think about enhancing flow, they don't think about, I need to make myself feel safe. But safety is a precursor to flow. We're not mm-hmm. talking about someone having an impairment. We're talking about amplifying and, and creating environments, whether it's music, it can be scent, uh, it can be breathing. It can be innervating all of those senses simultaneously yeah. for for uh, changes in physiological functioning. But um, you know, experimenting with creating the feeling of safety and how we do that as organizations and teams um, together. Yeah, I, I love that too. And you know, I always conceptualize kind of like when we think about like the major influencers of heart rate variability, especially if we're thinking about it from kind of like a you know sympathetic drive and, and parasympathetic flow, is that if we are in a state where we do we feel kind of a direct um, or we don't feel kind of a direct sense of safety and belongingness, uh, then uh, our nervous system is going to be ramped up every single time because it's always kind of waiting for the mountain lion around the corner. Uh, it's kind of saying like, is this the moment where I'm going to, you know, have that threat pounce around and get me? And while that may sound a little bit exaggerated, even these kind of minor, minor quote unquote stressors that we experience throughout the day, they compound to the same effect of feeling like, again, every corner we turn around, like our sense of safety and belongingness um, is just not going to be there. So whatever we can do to surround ourselves in an environment around people, kind of in a setting that allows for a sense of safety and belongingness is going to really help to calm the nervous system down. And then that's just going to manifest in heart rate variability going upward. And I tell people too, like HRV, at the end of the day, it's just data. It's just information that we have. Um, It's very valuable information, but it's really kind of what we do with it that matters, how it can inform our decision making, how it can inform our behavior. Um, And then we can use it again as a proxy. But in the end, what are we talking about? We're talking about how we can build fortitude and resiliency to when stress does occur, that it doesn't just tear us down, degrade us into kind of this like puddle of nothing, or we feel like a puddle of nothing, but it really helps us to kind of build these really strong muscles that is in our nervous system to say that when again the mountain lion truly does come around the corner like I have the ability to either fight or flee from it but then be safe and protected in the end and if we can do that if we can build that sense of fortitude of safety of belongingness then again we're not going to be kind of crushed to our core every single time we experience a stressor do do, do you agree with that or does that feel like that's overstepping yeah but and it's all very true, but the piece point I'm making is that it's a precursor to flow. Mm-hmm. So you want to go give the best presentation of your life in front of 500 people. Um, <laughs> right now, we're going to practice optimizing our HRV um, by simultaneously integrating sensory experiences that make our body feel safe mm-hmm. and and practicing our breathing to, to amplify our performance. So, right. um so I, I view safety as a necessary component of being able to go into flow quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and so some of the things I've experimented with are using scents mm-hmm. and sounds while breathing. Like essential oils, is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so that we're innervating the senses through multiple parasympathetic pathways. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it's just, it's, it's very interesting. There are other pieces like scheduling. I know intermittent fasting is, mm-hmm. is pursued by a lot of people. Um, but there is also something to be said that if you have uh, a performance moment, having 
for a week eating at the same times every day mm-hmm. helps to behaviorally tell your body you're safe. And and uh, so there's there's different ways or having sleep wake times that are the same and your body can predict. Um, there were there are different ways behavioral inputs, sensory inputs, breathing inputs uh, to kind of amplify that feeling of safety for peak performance moments. Yeah, I like that. I, I don't think I've uh, necessarily conceptualized it as a means of safety, but I like that. I mean, I think that's a really good way to think of it. I, I, I think of, you know, Andrew Huberman um, talks a lot about like getting sunlight in the morning and then kind of like a forward movement generation, which uh, is something that I've kind of always done, but have not really kind of conceptualized it as a form of safety as a repetitive behavior. However, I, I could see that like that actually makes sense to me now. Um, so I appreciate you kind of highlighting it at those means uh, because uh, again it's just not something that I my, my mind meant to it is that one that you use a lot um, sunlight as yes. a key driver yes indeed. yeah yeah indeed. cool cool well I know that we're getting a little bit close on time um, so maybe we can kind of I, I always kind of like to finish the podcast with sure. like getting down to brass tacks um, so saying like in, in the end like if we had to say like here are the first few things um, that if that you could start today um, that could be effective and, and you think could be helpful like what might you provide to the listeners to say like today maybe try this or maybe try this as a good means of starting out some of these uh, practices and trainings yeah so for the person who hasn't experienced heart rate variability biofeedback just yet and just wants to engage the breath and start to play around uh, with using the breath to optimize the body and you can use it before specific performance moments a phone call a a talk a a decision you want to make i'm taking five breaths with an inhale of four and an exhale of six. Now, that's not necessarily everyone's specific resonant frequency, but it's a general measure um, that will elicit some <laughs> benefits for you, mm-hmm. um, just to start with. So trying to use that and using that a few times per day, um, and then moving towards breathing at resonant frequency where you can use the four and six or you can go deeper and try and identify your resonant frequency. And there's several different apps that will help you do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and using this as the way you start the day and the way you end your day. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in my book, heart breath mind talk about the benefits of 20 minutes twice a day. Some people have to work up to it and that's okay. Sure. And if you have to start with 10 week one. That's okay. And you build up to the 20. Um, Mm -hmm. but so first I would use it situationally to, to see how you can use breathing to amplify performance. And then the second is using this systematically as a start and end to your day. One, it's, it's one of those behavioral inputs for safety, which leads to flow. Um, but two, what you're trying to do is create that automated response that during stressful moments, instead of a, a sympathetic response, your body is much more efficient at, at, staying in a pair staying or invoking a parasympathetic state Mm-hmm. Yes, beautiful. You know, I, a lot of people ask me about the whole like 20 on you know 20 20 type practice so 40 minutes a day. And I always tell them, like, listen, if you look at the literature, like, that's what the literature is highlighted. I mean, you know, again, if you look at, you know, the studies by, you know, Paul Lair, uh, you know, by uh, Dick Gewurz, I mean, a lot of the guys are kind of indicated, again, the, there's these really good time frames where we see that we can kind of maximize the benefit. But I but I love that you kind of mentioned, like, you don't have to just try to jump right in to, you know, 20 minutes, you know, twice a day of practice. That might feel like a lot to people. It is a lot. It's a, it's a lot of practice. It's a lot of time that you're devoting, though, you know, most people are spending, what, like, four hours on their, you know, Instagram each day. So, uh, you yeah. <laughs> know. Yeah, you know, teach their own, but uh, but but I think that it's one of those things like you don't you wouldn't throw somebody into kind of the ring and say like I want you to meditate now for an hour and they've never meditated before like it's just it's not going to work out well to their favorites it could feel a little bit like a waste of time to them. Um, but however, I do like this idea of kind of like let's just kind of slowly move forward and approximate that that uh, twenty minute time so that again you are developing that level of automation you're developing that level of reflex um, so that when kind of the crap does hit the fan, you're much more likely to turn to that as your means and as your tool to manage uh, than, you know, something else that might be a little bit more detrimental or deleterious to kind of, you know, the the experience, which for a lot of people might be like, you know, emotionally acting out or it could be, you know, whatever it may be for them. 
So I, I, I love that too. Um, would you say, Leah, like obviously, you know, with Hanu Health, we have a lot of technology that's going to be coming out here soon. But like, would you say that you're someone that if they've never done HRV biofeedback, that they uh, should like, go out and get an HRV biofeedback type, you know, tool or mechanism? Should they see like a HRV like clinician, like somebody's board certified like you or like me, or is it just like they should just start kind of with none of that tech and just really kind of utilize their, their own base physiology? Look, if they have access to an HRV biofeedback clinician, the benefits are exponentially greater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, being able to access and do things at home are wonderful with, with the equipment. Um, But I am a, you know, a, a big proponent of working with someone that can take them through the process. Really, it's a 10 week process, meeting once per week, doing their breathing twice a day, but actually learning a skill set, not only to optimize their baseline, but to shift their stress before, during and after uh, their stress levels before, during and after a, a stressor. Um, so there's benefit to that. There's just it's 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 really what fits the needs of the individual. And um, and certainly having the tech is helpful. Um, having someone to help you guide through the experience, I think, is wonderful if it's accessible to you. Yes. Now, in, indeed, yeah, I think that you and I are always going to be huge proponents of like actually seeing, you know, a biofeedback clinician, whether, you know, it's a psychologist or someone who has that training. Uh, you know, I've talked uh, a little ad nauseum on the podcast about too, if you're looking for somebody and you kind of want at least the base entry level of standard for somebody who is a clinician, you can go on to websites like bcia.org um, that will actually like show you who locally is a, you know, HRV biofeedback clinician or, but, yep, indeed. And that's really helpful because you know that at least that they have, you know, the standard of training um, to be able to provide you with those services. And, uh, you know, again, you know, it's one of those things that if you're seeing any type of clinician, you know, whether it's a psychologist or it's a physician or anybody, a lot of it too, even though, yes, we're talking a lot about utilizing objective data. It's like we've talked about before, like you have to have a good connection with that person. Um, And so again, like sometimes like you just need to make sure you feel them out and um, get in there, like see if you like them as a person, um, see if you feel like you can connect with them and then man, hightail it and, you know, press the gas pedal down because it's so much fun and it's somebody for for me too like when I was getting you know training and education in this I I said like I've got I got to have somebody you know to work with myself like I want to experience what it's like to be the client and not just be the clinician and uh, it was just it was pivotal for me to experience that as a clinician to then say like yeah this is like this is it like there's just so much incredible value uh, in, in this type of relationship and in this type of training so I love it so, Dr. Leah Lagos, like I really appreciate you being on here. Like you've been, been a so wealth fun to of knowledge. Talk with you, Jay. Absolutely. I want to tell people how to find you. So, obviously, you have Dr. Uh, Dr. Leah Lagos uh, Your book, Heart, Breath, and Mind. You can pick it up on Amazon. We'll link it in the show notes, which will be at hanuhealthcom slash podcast. You'll be able to get that book on Amazon, which is incredible. the The beautiful thing about it, Leah, is that it is so crazy um uh, just practical like that is the best <laughs> thing about it is because like you could have gone and written you know a, a thousand page book on like the uh, that super scientifically dense on heart rate variability which someone like for me would be like oh yeah like let's bring it on i love it but i love that you uh you you hold true to the science and you explain it but in very easy to understand concepts and then you say okay like you've got the basis of information now like here is the protocol Yep. Here's how you do it. I'm assuming that's what you were going for. Yeah. My, <laughs> my hope in this lifetime is to bring HRV biofeedback to as many people as possible. And, mm. and I, you know, I work with elite competitors in, in athletics and business and, but I wanted something to, to help everybody. Yes. Uh, this is something that I believe optimizes health performance, but really can change the world. Yes. So. Absolutely. So please make sure everybody that you go on get Dr. Leah's book, um, Heart, Breath, Mind. It is incredible. Follow her, you know, too, on her website. She's got a lot of great education, a lot of information. Uh, and uh, yeah, and are you on, I think you're on Instagram, but do, do, do you do much like, uh, yeah, you're on Instagram. So at Dr. Leah Lagos, I believe, but we'll again, we'll, we'll put it all in the show notes. So uh, Dr. Leah, thank you so much again. Such a we'll have pleasure, to, Jay. Thank in, you. Indeed. Thank you. So everybody, I hope that you have a great rest of the the week as always we'll be back next friday until then make sure that you are focusing on that breath focusing on the heart and doing what you can to build that fortitude of stress resiliency all right everybody take care
Thanks for listening to the Hanu Health Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. This podcast would not happen without listeners and supporters like you. And the best way to support us and the show is to head on over to iTunes and provide us with a five-star review. This helps us reach others and spread the good word of breathing and stress resiliency. If we read your five-star review on air, please reach out to podcast at hanuhealth.com with your name and mailing address, and we will send you some sweet Hanu gear. Until next time, breathe better and stress less.